So I'd like to take just a moment of uh, personal privilege this morning to tell you a little bit about the anthem today and why it's particularly special. Um, if you notice in the bulletin, there is a dedication line, and that is what happens when an anthem is commissioned, um, when someone um, writes a piece for a specific ensemble or a specific purpose. And today's anthem was commissioned a number of years ago by the Reverend Bob Hall. Um, Bob used to sing in the choir with us. Um, he now uh, lives at the Westminster uh, Retirement Home and regretfully was not able to be with us this morning to hear it. But we do have a special treat. Um, our composer, who is Bob Powell, our Trinity Campus organist, is here with us today. And so we greatly appreciate his presence. Bob, would you stand, please? He's right over here. George. Bob is a, a wonderful organist and um, very prolific composer. And as I told the congregation at 845, when a piece is commissioned, it's not a guarantee that it will be published. But I think Bob's batting average is pretty high. I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but this piece is being published by the St. James Music Press, which is out of Tryon. And we recorded it here on Wednesday night for their website. So going forward, any um, choir director that wants to hear what Psalm 47 sounds like, they'll click on the link and they'll get to hear the choir. So we thank Bob for writing it and we hope you enjoy Psalm 47. I did this in the early service, and it's not in my notes. It's just something I want to say to you. Um, Memorial Day has unfortunately become a, par a party and not a remembrance. There are people from this country stationed all over the world, and they've given their life to protect us. Many have died. And from the Civil War to World War II, World War I, all of the skirmishes and battles since then, 
Americans have given their life so that you might be free. Now, compared to the gift of God in Jesus Christ, that's small. But compared to human endeavor and opportunity and ability and willingness, it is magnificently large. We are free today because of people who died for us. And I am grateful for them. Come by my house tomorrow. There'll be a, <clears throat> an American flag up front, out front. I'm not, I'm a Christian first, but by cracky, this matters. It matters. So remember on Memorial Day, take a moment, stop. I think the right hour is 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but you can do it anytime. And remember and say thank you for those who have given their lives that we might have life in this place. So thank you for, they've had all kinds of things thrown at them today from up here. <laughs> and we are grateful that you allow us from time to time to do that. The gospel lesson for the morning is found in the gospel according to St. John. It's John 14, 8 through 17 and 25 through 27. I would invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you that the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact will do greater works than these. Because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you. And will be in you. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be Please be seated. For 20 years, I've been training interns. Every summer I've had another one. And people think that when you get interns, the trick is to let them do all the work and you just go play golf. You trust me, that doesn't happen. In fact, your workload goes up by about 45%. But that's okay. Because we're trying to prepare young people 
to be the pastors when we're gone. It's an important work. Elaine Wilder was our new intern at Bethany back in 2007. As with all the interns that have come through Bethany and now through Buncombe Street over the last 20 years, Elaine was bright, capable, enthusiastic, eager to learn, and ready to serve. She's a member of the North Georgia Conference today. She came to us with extraordinary skill and tremendous capacity to serve the church faithfully and effectively in the days ahead. Which is the reason that I was taken aback when she asked the question that I had not spoken to because it seemed so obvious to me. But that may be exactly what the 21st century church is doing with people everywhere. We've known the story. We've known it for so long that we forget that our story must be told afresh to each succeeding generation if we simply sit on what we have received and don't share it. Christianity as you and I know it will cease to exist. Philip had followed Jesus for three years. He'd been a faithful disciple. He had seen Jesus heal the sick. He had heard him unlock the truth of God for crowds and for the disciples themselves. He had seen him go apart to pray. He had witnessed the miracles. Yet he looked at his Lord and said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. So many of us are Philip. We've heard all this stuff, and I think we kind of believe it, but you show us, and we'll be satisfied. What seemed unmistakably obvious to Jesus had been completely missed by Philip. Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me, he said, has seen the Father. So let us not leave this day without stating with clarity the foundational doctrine of the Christian church. Jesus is God. Come to dwell among us full of grace and truth. And if you have seen him, you have seen the Father. Now, I know that frightens people. But the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are not separate. They are one. And they are three. And this is a mystery that I can't explain, that Augustine couldn't explain, that Aquinas couldn't explain, that the great theologians of the church couldn't explain. We accept it on faith that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. And it is only by faith that we know that. In the uh, contemporary service downstairs, they probably don't even sing this song anymore because it's, it's, it's old contemporary. I, I, I know most of us don't understand old or new contemporary, but, but, but it's a song they sing, and, and I've heard it, I've preached in the contemporary worship, especially in Somerville more than even here. And they sing this song. It says, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart that I may see you, that I may see you. Open the eyes of my heart, which is an odd phrase. But for those of us who are Christians, it makes complete sense. 
But having seen God is not all there is to signing on in a great tradition, being a part of what God is doing. There's more. You desire with all your heart to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and become part of a band of Christians who are soldiers on a mission for the sake of Jesus Christ. We treat, we treat the Christian faith like something that is a take-it-or-leave-it decision. But those of us who have been called of God have been given a mission. It's a mission that's worth living for and it's worth dying for. And if it's less than that, you, like Philip, will not be satisfied. I still remember moving onto the campus at the University of South Carolina. It was 1972. That first day was filled with excitement and enthusiasm and plans. And it was still hot. Must have been 150 degrees in Columbia. I was excited about being there. I signed up for eight o'clock classes. I bought my books. I laid out my necessary equipment for being a student and, and determined, determined, absolutely determined to take this place by storm. I'd begun with the end, end in mind, fame, success, financial security, that's what I was there for. But pretty soon, my, my goals no longer motivated me. You ever had that experience? You had goals and you were shooting for them and they just didn't motivate you anymore? I got lost in the sidetracks that College readily avails to one. They make that easy to do if you choose. See, 8 o'clock started coming awfully early. Different than it did when I thought about it at the beginning. I figured out that, that these freshman courses were so easy that, that I could conquer them without going to very many classes. I crammed the night before finals really, really hard, 12, 13 hours. But it was like trying to absorb an entire course in one night. And it was too late. That first semester was an unmitigated disaster, to put it mildly. You see, everybody had told me about college. But I just thought I was smarter than that. So I tried to do it my own way. I tried to do this the way I thought it should be done. And I did that for two semesters to be sure. Doing it on my own has always been a failure in my life. Every time I've done it. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I'll ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. And this is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. But it is in our arrogance, our dogged self-sufficiency, that we miss what Jesus has to say to us. 
bottom line, you can't do this Christian thing on your, on your own. You cannot do this on your own. And invariably, there are some who will say, well, I can. And they try. And once they've tried, they lie. Because you can't do it on your own. It doesn't work that way. They succeed at keeping the rules and doing what my grandmother used to call playing pretty. But being all that God would have us be is a function not of our striving, but it is a function of our receiving. I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. Another word that we use to translate that is helper, one to come alongside us, to walk with us, to whisper in our ear and remind us that we have gotten off track. That's always available to every one of us. You don't have to be sitting in church on Sunday morning. That happens to all of us. But only some heed it. It matters whether you listen. I think some of us are afraid. We live our lives in fear. Fear that fear that maybe we're gonna be on our 52nd wedding anniversary and not come home. Fear that We're going to get it wrong. Fear that we're going to die. Fear is the enemy of faith. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. For everyone who's faced a loss, for for everyone who's faced failure, for everyone who's come up short, the fear of failure means we're still trying to do it ourselves. Living in fear means we think we've got to do it perfectly every time. And the truth is, except by the grace of God, none of us will do that. So do this. Obey the commandments. Trust in my presence, says Jesus. And whatever else you do, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It is the great enemy of faith. And it leads to nothing good. Obey my commandments. Trust my presence. And don't be afraid. And God will handle everything else. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stand with me as we affirm our faith together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Make
Memorial Day is almost upon us. I hope yours is full of peace and full of joy and full of thanksgiving and full of remembrance of those who have given so much for us. And while you're remembering the soldiers and the sailors and the Marines, remember that your life was saved in Christ. It's what matters most. Go in peace. Serve God and your neighbor in all that you do and the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and always. Amen.